Popocatepetl and Iztaccíhuatl, by Juliet Pigott Wood. Myth. Background. The oral tradition is the collection of songs, stories, and poems that are passed from generation to generation by word of mouth. People use the traditional stories to communicate shared beliefs and to explain their world. In Popocatépetl and Iztaccíhuatl, you will see how the storyteller shares Aztec attitudes and beliefs through a tale that describes a pair of teenagers who fall in love. About the author. Juliet Pigott Wood, born 1924, died 1996, discovered her love for learning about different cultures while living in Japan, where her grandfather was a legal advisor to Prince Ito. Wood's interest in Japan inspired her to produce several books on Japanese history and folklore. Her fascination with one culture led to research about others. Wood went on to co-author a book retelling famous fairy tales from around the world. Popocatépetl and Iztaccíhuatl by Juliet Pigott Wood before the Spaniards came to Mexico and marched on the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, there were two volcanoes to the southeast of that city. The Spaniards destroyed much of Tenochtitlan and built another city in its place and called it Mexico City. It is known by that name still, and the pass through which the Spaniards came to the ancient Tenochtitlan is still there as are the volcanoes on each side of that pass. Their names have not been changed. The one to the north is Iztaccíhuatl, and the one on the south of the pass is Popocatépetl. Both are snow-capped and beautiful, Popocatépetl being the taller of the two. That name means smoking mountain. In Aztec days, it gushed forth smoke, and on occasion... It does so still. It erupted too in Aztec days and has done so again since the Spaniards came. Iztaccíhuatl means the white woman, for its peak was, and still is, white. Perhaps Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatépetl were there in the highest part of the Valley of Mexico in the days when the earth was very young, in the days when the new people were just learning to eat and grow corn. The Aztecs claimed the volcanoes as their own, for they possessed a legend about them and their creation, and they believed that legend to be true. There was once an Aztec emperor in Tenochtitlan. He was very powerful. Some thought he was wise as well, whilst others doubted his wisdom. He was both a ruler and a warrior, and he kept at bay those tribes living in and beyond the mountains surrounding the Valley of Mexico, with its huge lake called Texcoco, in which Tenochtitlan was built. His power was absolute, and the splendor in which he lived was very great. It is not known for how many years the emperor ruled in Tenochtitlan, but it is known that he lived to a great age. However, it was not until he was in his middle years that his wife gave him an heir, a girl. The emperor and empress loved the princess very much, and she was their only child. She was a dutiful daughter and learned all she could from her father about the art of ruling, for she knew that when he died, she would reign in his stead in Tenochtitlan. Her name was Iztaccíhuatl. Her parents and her friends called her Ista. She had a pleasant disposition, and as a result, she had many friends. The great palace where she lived with the emperor and empress rang with their laughter when they came to the parties her parents gave for her. As well as being a delightful companion, Ista was also very pretty even beautiful. Her childhood was happy, and she was content enough when she became a young woman. But by then she was fully aware of the great responsibilities which would be hers when her father died, and she became serious and studious, and did not enjoy parties as much as she had done when younger. Another reason for her being so serious was that she was in love. 
This in itself was a joyous thing, but the emperor forbade her to marry. He wanted her to reign and rule alone when he died, for he trusted no one, not even his wife, to rule as he did, except his much-loved only child, Ista. This was why there were some who doubted the wisdom of the emperor, for by not allowing his heiress to marry, he showed a selfishness and short-sightedness towards his daughter and his empire, which many considered not truly wise. An emperor, they felt, who was not truly wise, could not also be truly great, or even truly powerful. The man with whom Ista was in love was also in love with her. Had they been allowed to marry, their state could have been doubly joyous. His name was Popo Catepetl, and Ista and his friends all called him Popo. He was a warrior in the service of the emperor, tall and strong, with a capacity for gentleness, and very brave. He and Ista loved each other very much, and while they were content and even happy when they were together, true joy was not theirs, because the emperor continued to insist that Ista should not be married when the time came for her to take on her father's responsibilities. This unfortunate but moderately happy relationship between Ista and Popo continued for several years, the couple pleading with the emperor at regular intervals, and the emperor remaining constantly adamant. Popo loved Ista no less for her father's stubbornness, and she loved him no less while she studied, as her father demanded she should do, the art of ruling in preparation for her reign. When the emperor became very old, he also became ill, in his feebleness he channeled all his failing energies towards instructing Ista in statecraft, for he was no longer able to exercise that craft himself. So it was that his enemies, the tribes who lived in the mountains and beyond, realized that the great emperor in Tenochtitlan was great no longer, for he was only teaching his daughter to rule and not ruling himself. The tribesmen came nearer and nearer to Tenochtitlan until the city was besieged. At last the emperor realized himself that he was great no longer, that his power was nearly gone, and that his domain was in dire peril. Warrior though he long had been, he was now too old and too ill to lead his fighting men into battle. At last he understood that, unless his enemies were frustrated in their efforts to enter and lay waste to Tenochtitlan, not only would he no longer be emperor, but his daughter would never be empress. Instead of appointing one of his warriors to lead the rest into battle on his behalf, he offered a bribe to all of them. Perhaps it was that his wisdom, if wisdom he had, had forsaken him. Or perhaps he acted from fear. Or perhaps he simply changed his mind. But the bribe he offered, to whichever warrior succeeded in lifting the siege of Tenochtitlan and defeating the enemies in and around the Valley of Mexico, was both the hand of his daughter and the equal right to reign and rule with her in Tenochtitlan. Furthermore, he decreed that directly he learned that his enemies had been defeated, he would instantly cease to be emperor himself. Ista would not have to wait until her father died to become empress. And if her father should die of his illness or old age before his enemies were vanquished, he further decreed that he who overcame the surrounding enemies should marry the princess, whether he, the emperor, lived or not. Ista was fearful when she heard of her father's bribe to his warriors, 
for the only one whom she had any wish to marry was Popo, and she wanted to marry him, and only him, very much indeed. The warriors, however, were glad when they heard of the decree. There was not one of them who would not have been glad to have the princess as his wife, and they all relished the chance of becoming emperor. And so the warriors went to war at their ruler's behest, and each fought trebly hard, for each was fighting not only for the safety of Tenochtitlan and the surrounding valley, but for the delightful bride and for the right to be the emperor himself. Even though the warriors fought with great skill, and even though each one exhibited a courage he did not know he possessed, the war was a long one. The emperor's enemies were firmly entrenched around Lake Texcoco and Tenochtitlan by the time the warriors were sent to war, and as battle followed battle, the final outcome was uncertain. The warriors took a variety of weapons with them, wooden clubs edged with sharp blades of obsidian, obsidian machetes, javelins which they hurled at their enemies from troughed throwing boards, bows and arrows, slings and spears set with obsidian fragments, and lances, too. Many of them carried shields woven from wicker and covered in tough hide, and most wore armor made of thick quilted cotton soaked in brine. The war was long and fierce. Most of the warriors fought together and in unison, but some fought alone. As time went on, natural leaders emerged, and of these, undoubtedly, Popo was the best. Finally, it was he, brandishing his club and shield, who led the great charge of running warriors across the valley, with their enemies fleeing before them to the safety of the coastal plains and jungles beyond the mountains. The warriors acclaimed Popo, as the man most responsible for the victory, and weary though they all were, they set off for Tenochtitlan to report to the emperor and for Popo to claim Ista as his wife at last. But a few of those warriors were jealous of Popo. Since they knew none of them could rightly claim the victory for himself, the decision among the emperor's fighting men that Popo was responsible for the victory had been unanimous. They wanted to spoil for him and for Ista the delights which the emperor had promised. These few men slipped away from the rest at night and made their way to Tenochtitlan ahead of all the others. They reached the capital two days later, having traveled without sleep all the way, and quickly let it be known that Although the emperor's warriors had been successful against his enemies, the warrior Popo had been killed in battle. It was a foolish and cruel lie which those warriors told their emperor, and they told it for no reason other than that they were jealous of Popo. When the emperor heard this, he demanded that Popo's body be brought to him so that he might arrange a fitting burial— he knew the man his daughter had loved would have died courageously. The jealous warriors looked at one another and said nothing. Then one of them told the emperor that Popo had been killed on the edge of Lake Texcoco and that his body had fallen into the water and no man had been able to retrieve it. The emperor was saddened to hear this. After a little while, he demanded to be told which of his warriors had been responsible for the victory. But none of the fighting men before him dared claim the successful outcome of the war for himself, for each knew the others would refute him. So they were silent. This puzzled the emperor, and he decided to wait for the main body of his warriors to return and not to press the few who had brought the news of the victory. And of Popo's death. Then the emperor sent for his wife and his daughter and told them their enemies had been overcome, 
the empress was thoroughly excited and relieved at the news. Ista was only apprehensive. The emperor, seeing her anxious face, told her quickly that Popo was dead. He went on to say that the warrior's body had been lost in the waters of Lake Texcoco. And again, it was as though his wisdom had left him. For he spoke at some length of his not being able to tell Ista who her husband would be and who would become emperor when the main body of warriors returned to Tenochtitlan. But Ista heard nothing of what he told her, only that her beloved Popo was dead. She went to her room and lay down. Her mother followed her and saw at once she was very ill. Witch doctors were sent for, but they could not help the princess, and neither could her parents. Her illness had no name, unless it was the illness of a broken heart. Princess Istaxiwatl did not wish to live if Popocatépetl was dead, and so she died herself. The day after her death, Popo returned to Tenochtitlan with all the other surviving warriors. They went straight to the palace and with much cheering told the emperor that his enemies had been routed and that Popo was the undoubted victor of the conflict. The emperor praised his warriors and pronounced Popo to be the new emperor in his place. When the young man asked first to see Ista, begging that they should be married at once before being jointly proclaimed emperor and empress, the emperor had to tell Popo of Ista's death and how it had happened. Popo spoke not a word. He gestured the assembled warriors to follow him, and together they sought out the few jealous men who had given the false news of his death to the emperor. With the army of warriors watching, Popo killed each one of them in single combat with his obsidian-studded club. No one tried to stop him. That task accomplished, Popo returned to the palace and still without speaking, and still wearing his stiff cotton armor, went to Ista's room. He gently lifted her body and carried it out of the palace and out of the city, and no one tried to stop him doing that either. All the warriors followed him in silence. When he had walked some miles, he gestured to them again, and they built a huge pile of stones in the shape of a pyramid. They all worked together, and they worked fast while Popo stood and watched, holding the body of the princess in his arms. By sunset, the mighty edifice was finished. Popo climbed it alone, carrying Ista's corpse with him. There, at the very top, under a heap of stones, he buried the young woman he had loved so well and for so long, and who had died for the love of him. That night, Popo slept alone at the top of the pyramid by Ista's grave. In the morning he came down and spoke for the first time since the emperor had told him the princess was dead. He told the warriors to build another pyramid, a little to the southeast of the one which held Ista's body, and to build it higher than the other. He told them, too, to tell the emperor on his behalf that he, Popocatépetl, would never reign and rule in Tenochtitlan. He would keep watch over the grave of the princess Istaxiwatl for the rest of his life. The messages to the emperor were the last words Popo ever spoke. Well before the evening, the second mighty pile of stones was built. Popo climbed it and stood at the top, taking a torch of resinous pine wood with him. And when he reached the top, he lit the torch 
and the warriors below saw the white smoke rise against the blue sky, and they watched as the sun began to set, and the smoke turned pink, and then a deep red, the color of blood. So Popocatépetl stood there, holding the torch in memory of Istaxiwatl for the rest of his days. The snows came, and as the years went by, the pyramids of stone became high, white-capped mountains. Even now the one called Popocatépetl emits smoke in memory of the princess whose body lies in the mountain which bears her name.